Well, good evening. We're glad that you have chosen to join us live in person. And those of you that are joining us online, welcome to Sagamore Baptist Church in, in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, we are just glad that you uh, decided to be with us this evening. And uh, we have been looking at the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. Uh, which when you look at the uh, first 75 years of our Southern Baptist Convention, uh, this was the con confession that we held to as Baptists. And it went all the way back to 1689. It wasn't until 1925 when E.Y. Mullins and L.R. Scarborough, uh, uh, Dr. Scarborough was a professor and a president at Southwestern Baptist Theological uh, Seminary here in Fort Worth. Uh, he and e, Dr. E.Y. Mullins came together and worked on the Baptist faith and message in 1925. Then it was um, uh, revamped just a little bit, and there were some paragraphs that were added in 1963 under the direction uh, of the committee chairperson, who was Dr. Herschel Hobbs. You, you all remember the uh, Sunday School Board uh, Sunday School material. The commentary in the Sunday School books were from Herschel Hobbs. And Dr. Hobbs pastored up in Oklahoma. And then in 1998, under the tutelage of Dr. Paige Patterson, there was uh, some addendums to the Baptist faith and message concerning the family and marriage, those, those things. And then in 2000, under, under Dr. Adrian Rogers' uh, chairmanship, the committee also changed some things and added some things uh, to what we now have, the Baptist faith and message 2000. And so... It's good to be able to study and see the different things that have gone on. And uh, not only that, uh, it's good for us to be able to learn doctrine together as a church body. Those of you that are online and those of you that are here in person, it's just good to learn doctrine. Uh, because when you look at scripture, uh, it's a doctrinal text. Okay. And there's a lot of people that will say in churches nowadays, for whatever reason, we don't need doctrine. We just need some good preaching. Well, if your good preaching doesn't include doctrine, then it ain't good preaching. Okay. And so we need to have good doctrine. And uh, uh, the reason I'm a Southern Baptist is because I believe the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 uh, is good doctrine. Uh, now, it's ambiguous enough that, that and the tent is wide enough uh, that you can fall anywhere in between conservative and liberalism with this Baptist Faith and Message 2000. But when you look at it, well, I shouldn't say that 10 is large enough for liberals because it really isn't. The Baptist Faith and Message is a conservative document. It's a conservative confession, okay? But it's big enough where you can hold to the doctrines of grace or you can hold to the doctrines of free will or have a hybrid of, of those and still be in the tent, of Southern Baptist uh, life. Now, the big issue back in the 1980s was a biblical and theological issue of liberalism and conservatism. And uh, here in the state of Texas, we had uh, the Baptist General Convention of Texas, which is now called the Texas Baptist Convention. And, and uh, there was a liberal drift, even in our state convention, back in the 80s and then into the 90s especially. Uh, we ended up constituting the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention, of which we are uniquely aligned as Sagamore Baptist Church. Uh, we uniquely aligned with them, and this convention, state convention, uh, of which we are a part, constituted with 125 churches in 1997. And uh, our state convention that we are uniquely aligned with, Southern Baptists of Texas Convention, um, holds to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. That's what we affirm as a state convention. That's what our church affirms according to our constitution and bylaws, okay? And so it's just important for us to know uh, what we as Sagamore Baptist Church say that we believe. And but, but I want to add, we also need to know why we believe what we believe, okay? And so that's why, you know, and I go through this almost weekly, this, this explanation. But I want you to be able to leave here. And when somebody says, what do y'all do on Wednesdays? You can say, we are learning some good doctrine. And uh, because we're looking at the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. And then we're going to be looking at the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which our church ascribes to. OK, and so uh, I want you to be able to know what it is that we're doing. And I want you to be able to learn uh, some good biblical doctrine also. Now, 
here's the question and I want to hear some, some answers. Now, Dr. Cooper, I, I don't want you to answer just yet. Okay. Until I call on you. Okay. Uh, because I know, I know you already know the answer to this simple question that I'm about to ask. Why do you think, okay, that's okay. Cause I, I have brother Paul McCord that will answer. And why do you think that doctrine is important in the church? Why do you think that doctrine is important in the church? Rich, you, you're ready to go. Well, just this occurred to me is because our, our uh, New Testament apostles and the writings affirm and confirm that doctrine is important. Okay. So the New Testament, Brother Rich said, New Testament writers affirm that doctrine is important. Okay. Yeah. That's a great reason. It, in other words, it's biblical. <laughs> okay. Who else? Why why is doctrine important in the church? If you don't have that, then somebody you're trying to reach somebody with the gospel and they you know, they're gonna say, Well, what do you really believe? Why do you believe to what is all of this? And if you don't know your doctrine, you can't answer it. Okay, so if somebody that you're sharing the gospel with asks you certain questions and you don't know the answer to it, then there, there's not really much reason to to give them to believe what you believe. Okay, is it, it didn't Peter the apostle write in First Peter three fifteen be prepared to give a defense of the faith? Okay, so doctrinal teaching is is helping you to learn how to defend your faith. Okay, do you have something? Do you have some reason? I'm you're the only one sitting in that section. <laughs> Bill, what do you think? For guidance. For guidance, okay. Okay. So doctrine gives you more guidance in the scriptures and gives you a better understanding of what God wants you to do. Okay. Is is that right? Okay. Merlene? I think that's a foundation. Everything else will fall if we don't have any doctrine then. If we can just build and say what we want to. Sure. But it will fall unless there's a foundation. Okay, so if you're building a house, you need a good foundation, and doctrine is that good foundation. Okay, Deanne, I think you were going to say something. Well, no, it, to me, doctrine is just another way of saying it, an organized list of truth according to scripture. Okay, an organized list of truth according to the scripture. I like that. That's good. I think Deanne should write that. I think you should. Uh, Dr. Cooper thinks that Deanne should be writing a theological treatise on doctrine, the doctrines, the great doc. Let's call it the great doctrines of the scriptures. Okay, Brother Rich. Paul said, um, and to oh, well, Paul in the Bible, not Paul, not Paul McCord, Paul the Apostle. Yeah, although I think Paul, Paul, I think yeah, Paul could write a good theological yeah. uh, treatise for the truth that once and for all handed down it's, yeah there's that sense that this is the final revelation of god until he returns again, yeah so uh, but that we are to contend for that we're, we're supposed to contend for the faith to, uh, yeah guard it. Mm -hmm. and it is it is uh worthy to be guarded and we're commanded to guard what we believe okay and uh and, and to guard what the doctrines of the scriptures are okay now Let's hear what Dr. Kenneth Cooper, uh, the Right Reverend of of uh, Far East Fort Worth, uh, would how he would answer the need for doctrine in the church. Before we do that, mm -hmm. I want to comment on something you said earlier about the defense of the faith by Peter. If you look at that text, the word translated defense is the Hebrew word apologia, which actually doesn't mean defense at all; it means explanation. Mm -hmm. We don't need to defend our faith, we need to explain it. Mm. So that not only we... And that's the same Greek word where you get apologetics from. Yes, yeah. Yes. And that's really what apologetics is. Mm -hmm. it's explaining our faith. Okay. And, uh, Good word. Yeah. And that's the whole idea. Is that people know not just what we believe, but why we believe it. And right. It's not necessarily defending it, it's just saying this is the way it is. After all, Pastor, how many times have you stood up and said, I don't totally agree with you. <laughs> and you're right. It doesn't matter whether we agree with you. If you're teaching the truth, God's going to uh, stand by that. You know, I specifically mean when I say 
I don't care what you say if you agree or disagree. You know, I'm only talking to you. No, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I'm teasing with you, Kim. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's why. That's why you're doctor, doctor. Can I go back to the issue of doctrine? I prefer the word theology. It's more sophisticated and it's more academic. I know, but that's what it is. Theology comes from the Greek words "theos," "logos," "study of God." And theology is all about God. Take theology out of the Bible, you got nothing left. Yeah, yeah. Because the Bible is all about God. It is His revelation to us. And our idea in studying it is to get to know Him. Yeah. It's not to, to become academically smart. It's to get to, to know God. It's to get to know Him and then to help others know Him yes, at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Okay, because if, if you just get to know him, but you don't say anything to other people about it, what good is it? Exactly. It's only good for you, but it's, it's uh, you know, what's good for you is good for everybody else when you know, when you know the Lord. Okay. Well, along that line, still, mm -hmm. this book written in the last century, my opinion, but it's right. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> Knowing God. J.I. Packer. Packer's Knowing God is probably the quintessential book that is absolutely necessary by every believer mm -hmm. to read. It's absolutely sure. crucial that you read that book, not just once, not just twice, but at least once, twice, three times a year is how good Knowing God by J.I. Packer is. I have it on my Kindle and I read through it at least once a year and uh, excellent read, excellent book. Absolutely. Now we are in chapter 20 of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. And uh, the gospel and the extent of its grace is the title of this chapter. We looked last week at uh, paragraph one, and this week we're gonna be looking at the second paragraph in this particular uh, chapter, chapter 20 of this, uh, of this confession. Now, uh, it's, it's so important, um, that we we understand. Let me see if I can figure out how to work this thing here real quick. Uh, it's important for us to be able to um, think about uh, what it is that we are learning in such a way that we actually learn how to apply it uh, to our daily lives as well. Uh, but I want you to know something. You cannot apply what you don't know, okay? So this is another reason why we need to know what the scriptures are teaching, because you can't apply the scriptures if you don't know them. Uh, there's some people that will want to read a passage of scripture, and the first thing they think about is, how does this apply to me? That's not the first question uh, to ask. The first question is, what does God say here? Okay. Once I know what God says here, then Lord, how do you want me to apply it to my life today? Okay. And it's so important that we understand that. I, I have friends that, you know, that's the first thing they want to do is apply, but you can't apply anything that you don't know. Okay. So uh, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you all for your answers. I, I just knew, I knew, and I tell people, I tell people, I have the smartest church in all of the United States right here at Sagamore Baptist Church. And uh, I can tell just because of y'all's love for the Lord and your love for uh, his word. And so I'm very proud of that. Okay. Let's pray real quick. Lord, thanks for the day you've given us. Thank you for letting us have your word so that we might know you. And in order that we might be able to explain our faith to others and to help others come to a true biblical understanding of who Jesus Christ is, what it is that you did, what it is that you're doing, Lord Jesus, and what it is that you intend to do even in the future. And thank you for leaving your Holy Spirit for us to fill us up. And we do ask him to fill us even now that in word, in thought, in deed, we might glorify the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for sending your son uh, to be our propitiation and to die for our sins according to the scriptures and to be buried and be raised again according to the scriptures so that we might have everlasting abundant life. And it's in Christ's name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. All right. For those of you that are online, I've just posted the paragraph, that the first paragraph that we're going to discuss tonight. And it reads like this. This promise of Christ and of salvation through him is revealed in the word of God alone. The works of creation and providence, when assisted only by the light of nature, do not reveal Christ or grace through him, even in a general or obscure way. 
much less are those without the revelation of him in the promise or gospel enabled to attain saving faith or repentance by seeing these works of God. Okay, so we're going to look at some scripture now that co uh, coincides with this paragraph that we just read. And uh, the first scripture passage that I want you to see is Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17. And the first part of that uh, paragraph said this, this, this promise of Christ and of salvation through him is revealed in the word of God alone. Okay. Now, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, you can read every book under the sun looking for a way to be saved from this old wicked world. And you can read anything and everything from every nation, every continent, every tribe and tongue. But until you read the revelation of God that's founded in the Bible, you will never know the gospel. Okay. If you look at all the different world religions, it's always works based. Uh, when you look at, at uh, salvation, it is in Christ alone in Christianity. And it's not in your work, but it's in the work of Christ alone and none other. And the Bible teaches us that the righteous man shall live by faith. You notice what he says in verse 17 there in Romans chapter 1. It is written, and I think that comes out of Habakkuk, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and one of the things that Paul is saying here is, listen, faith, faith, it takes faith in order for you to be righteous. It's not the works that you do, because all the works that you do are external, but it's faith that something is inside. And we know something else that Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, again, for by grace you were saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The word that, the antecedent of that, goes back to not only the grace, but also the faith. And so God gives us the portion of faith to believe him when his Holy Spirit is quickening our dead spirit to come to life in Jesus Christ. And so it's by his grace that any of us in this room or those of you that are online, it's a wonder that God at all would give us his grace and the portion of faith to believe him and to trust him. Okay. There's no other way. And the Bible is so clear about this. Now, notice what he says in verse 16. The gospel of Christ, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Okay. You must believe, even though God is the one who inclines your will to Jesus Christ, there's still that human responsibility of you choosing, and there's still that human responsibility of you believing, but he gives you the chooser to choose him, and he gives you the belief to believe him, okay? Now, that's important to remember. You would not do this in and of yourself, okay? I think John chapter 1, verses 12 and verse 13 is pretty clear about that. Uh, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, uh, to those who believed in his name, not as a result of, of uh, the flesh or not the result of the blood and from whatever bloodline you come, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. Okay. So he's given you that right, but there was still that responsibility to believe and receive. And it's by the will of God that we believe and we receive, okay? Or we receive and believe. And so uh, when Paul is speaking here in this paragraph that we looked at uh, just a moment ago, this promise of Christ and of salvation through him is revealed in the word of God alone. You're not going to get any of that in any other book except in this book right here. Now, this is why we believe this is the truth. Now, I, I don't know about you. This is the best-selling book ever in all of humankind, best-selling book. And not only is it the best-selling book, but it's the only book that actually brings transformation to the hearts and minds of those who read it and study it, okay? And that's by God's will and it's by God's Holy Spirit working in his word to bring that about, okay? So it, it's just good to know uh, that when we come to Christ 
uh, it's because he's the one who's doing the work. Uh, because I'm just going to tell you right now, if I was doing the work for myself or for you, I would muck it up. <laughs> and and looking at this group of people here and thinking about those that are online, you all would mess it up equally as much. Okay, <laughs> It goes all the way back to Adam. He ruined it for the rest of us. You know, so uh, but praise God that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's what he says in his word. So uh, here's another uh, passage that I want you to look at in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. Romans 10, 14 through 17. For those of you online, I hope you have your copy of God's word. Write these references down, uh, but I also have them on the screen for your viewing uh, as well. This is what it says in verse 14 of chapter 10 in Romans. How then will they call on him, meaning Jesus, in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, the paragraph in, in the, uh, uh, that we uh, put up on the screen says, the works of creation and providence, when assisted only by the light of nature, do not reveal Christ or grace through him, even in a general or obscure way. Now, when you look at all of creation, and as, as Dr. Uh, Cooper likes to use the word theology or theological, uh, when you look at theology, and you study nature, uh, it's evident that there is intelligent design, okay? There's evidence of that. There are more scientists, secular, atheistic, agnostic, deistic scientists that are actually saying the evolution theory is not correct. There must be intelligent design, and there's more and more scientists that are moving away from evolution, even though uh, philosophically, uh, education has not moved away from that. Okay. But, and I forgot the website my brother uh, turned me on to that showed a list of over 1,800 current scientists uh, around the world that said there must be intelligent design. They didn't acknowledge Christ as the creator and the designer of everything, but they at least are saying there has to be intelligent design. Okay. Uh, but when, when you look at everything out there, theologically, it's speaking of general revelation. Okay, I love to look uh, at birds. Uh, Brother Spencer and I were at the seminary today, and I saw Kill D run across the street. And I said, you see that bird? And he said, yeah. I said, that's a Kill D. And, you know, they nest on the ground. And uh, I was explaining to him, I saw this video of a Kill D, uh, a mama Kill D that was trying to protect her little uh, Kill Ds that were, you know, chirping at her. And it was on a farm, you know, because they nest on the ground. And this farmer was coming with the blades as he was tilling up the ground. And that mama bird just spread her wings over her chicks and, and was raising her head, you know, uh, squawking, even though those blades were coming at her. Well, that's what that's what a bird does. OK, a mama bird does that. And the coolest thing is that farmer raised the blade just as he got to her and then set it down. And then all of a sudden you see the mom calm down and go back over her chicks. Isn't that cool? Now, now I can look at that bird and I can see that there's some sort of design to that bird. But that bird does not tell me that God exists or that God is or that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of all mankind. Okay? That bird doesn't teach me anything except that there is something greater outside of me, some intelligent designer that did these things. Okay, So this is what Paul is saying in Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then will they call on him to whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him uh, who, uh, whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Now, you are a preacher. You are a preacher. Those of you that are online that know Jesus, every single one of us are preachers. Okay. This idea, uh, there was an idea that came out through the Southern Baptist Convention many years ago, where if you would just live a good, godly example of a life, that people would come to know Jesus. That's not how people come to know Jesus. Mormons live good lives. Okay? Jehovah's Witnesses 
live good lives. Buddhists live good lives. I've got a, a, a couple of friends that are Buddhists. I go to their restaurant and eat at least once a week. And they are great Buddhists. They're some of the friendliest people that I've ever met. Some of the most compassionate and empathetic people that I've ever met. But they don't know Jesus. And we've talked about this. They're Buddhists. Okay. And, and they're okay that I believe in Jesus. I'm not okay that they're Buddhists though. Okay. Because <laughs> I want them to know Jesus. And, uh, but, but how would they have known that I love them enough to tell them about the Lord if I just go in and buy their faux soup every Friday uh, at lunchtime like I normally do? How would they know anything about Jesus unless I open my mouth? How will they hear unless they have a preacher, a proclaimer, in other words, somebody who actually speaks the gospel? Now, this is what I love about Miss Betty, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on you, and I hope I don't embarrass you. Uh, with our drive through coffee and prayer, her chief concern is whether or not that man or that woman that she prays with, and this is Brother Texas' concern as well, their concern, just like everybody that's out here that's uh, praying with people, their concern is, do you know Jesus or not? And on the card that those people fill out, there's a question. Uh, would you mind if we share something with you about Jesus Christ? Something to that effect. And if they say it's okay, guess what they're doing? Their main concern is to share the gospel with those folks that come by on Thursday mornings. Okay. That's the main concern. And they, so they're having gospel conversations. Since we started the drive through prayer and coffee, and the coffee is excellent. It comes out of Boston. The number one roaster in Boston uh, is, is where we get our beans from here at the church. And it's the best coffee in, in all, of, all of the United States, if you ask me. And so uh, they come. They don't even come for coffee anymore. They just come for prayer, and then we get to share the gospel with them. We still make coffee because there are a few, namely the pastor drinks a lot of the coffee when he gets here and shows up. And so, uh, but, but how will they hear unless we proclaim? OK, uh, just because we give them free coffee and just because we pray with them uh, doesn't mean that they know the gospel or that they've even heard the gospel. OK, and, and so there there has to be a preacher, a proclaimer. How will they preach unless they're sent? We're all sent. Jesus gave us a single mission. We don't go on missions. We don't go on mission trips. We go on mission. There's one single mission to go and make disciples of all the, all the nations. That's the only mission that Jesus gave us, okay? And, and so, uh, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Now, I'm not a foot, foot person. I'm just telling you, I'm not a foot person. I don't want to see your feet, okay? I don't want you to see my feet. I keep my feet covered, okay? Uh, when I'm at home, my feet are still covered. I don't take my socks off until I go to bed. And then in the morning, I put my house shoes on so no, my kids and my wife don't even see my feet. Okay, I mean, just I just don't uncover my feet unless I'm at the beach or something. Max, uh, I Max can look at my feet, but I certainly don't let him lick my feet. And because, um, Jan, that is just disgusting. Okay, <laughs> to have a dog lick your feet. Now, I don't care if your dog is cute. You shouldn't let your dog lick your feet. Okay. Can I get an amen and a witness from anybody? Amen. All right. No, no, let's, let's not, let's not get gross and talk about scabs on your feet. And stuff. No. Mm -mm. Uh, uh. Those, those of you that are online, I just want you to know, this is what it's like every Wednesday. You should be here just to witness what people say. Anyway, okay, so, but but how beautiful are the feet? Why? Because they're walking and they're going and they're making it a point to go and preach the gospel. That's the point of, of Paul using that verse out of Isaiah. They're actually going and preaching the gospel. So, however, they did not all heed the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Brother Mel, thank you for saying amen to what we were talking about. I don't know if you were talking about it, the feet being gross or that the feet the feet are beautiful because they're going and preaching the gospel. Praise you. Uh, praise the Lord for that. But but here he says, who's, re, who's re, uh, believed our report? They can only believe when they hear the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why gospel conversations are so important. Well, pastor, I just don't know what to say. 
Jesus left the Holy Spirit and he said that the Holy Spirit would bring to our minds, to our remembrance, what he wants us to say and what he wants us to know. Okay. Now I'm, I'm going to say something and some of you may not agree with this and that's okay. Um, I don't think simply sharing your testimony is sharing the gospel. In fact, I don't think that's sharing the gospel at all. It's giving testimony and witness to what the gospel has done in your life. But sharing the gospel is actually speaking what the gospel says, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 3 and 4. Okay. And, and that is so clear that the gospel message is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised again according to the scriptures. That is the gospel in a nutshell. And if you can learn that and know that, then you can speak the gospel to whomever you, with, with whomever you come into contact. Okay. It's that easy. Uh, you remember that, that little thing that we showed you on the screen the other day with the arrow coming down, Jesus came down, then the cross, he died for us. And then the little tomb, he was buried for us. And then the arrow going up, he, he was raised from the dead. And then the arrow coming down that he's coming back for us. Okay. And there should have been another arrow saying that it's going up because he's going to take us up to be with him, <laughs> you know, and there's the gospel message right there, even in picture form for people. Exactly where in the Bible it's going to be. I've used it the last two weeks. The little picture? Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so th those are different ways to be able to do that. And beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And what are those good things but salvation in Jesus Christ? Okay. And you all have beautiful feet because I know that you go out and you speak the gospel with other people and you share the gospel with people. <clears throat> <coughs> Whatever you do, don't stop. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> this is why I have a bottle of water with me all the time. Okay. So now the rest of the paragraph says this <clears throat> much less are those without the revelation of him in the promise or gospel and able to attain <clears throat> saving faith or repentance by seeing these works of God. Betty, can you get me another bottle of water from the kitchen? Thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I've got a cough drop here. This will work. If you can give me a bottle of water, that'd be great. Now I'll have a cough drop in my mouth at the same time. Okay. So, so the, the let me read the rest of the paragraph. Much less are those without the revelation of him and the promise or gospel and able to attain saving faith or repentance by seeing these works of God. Now, what does that mean, Pastor? Uh, what does it mean that they cannot be saved by seeing the works of God? Well, we just read in uh, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God in Romans 10, 17, okay? Now, I want you to look at Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. <clears throat> Oh, please. No chicken nuggets for me. Thank you. <laughs> oh. For those of you that are online, we somebody was frying uh, chicken nuggets in the kitchen. The whole foyer smells like chicken nuggets, fried chicken nuggets. So, all right. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Now, that word for vision right there, I, I want to explain that because in the Hebrew, uh, that word is better translated as revelation, where there is no revelation, okay? Uh, people will take this verse way, way out of context and say, and use this verse in churches, you know, the pastor is giving a vision, and, and if there is no vision, the people will perish. Well, I've been in churches where the pastor hasn't given a vision, but ain't nobody perishing, okay? <laughs> so that, that doesn't work. But that word for vision there means revelation. Uh, notice what it says in 29, 18 in Proverbs, where there is no revelation, 
The people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. There's what has been revealed. The word of God, the law was given to people. So therefore there was some restraint in their lives because they knew that there would be blessings and cursings, blessings if they obey the law and cursings if they don't. Blessings for those that came to, to the God of Israel and belief and obeyed the law or cursings for those that didn't, okay? And so the law, the revelation of God, which is his word, reveals uh, who God is, yes, but then also reveals what he desires from us and what he desires for us to do and he desires for us to believe. So the revelation of God, if there is no revelation of God to us, then we're unrestrained and lost and dead in sin and in trespass, okay? And that's what that verse really is speaking about. Uh, so it, it's important for us not to say, well, the preacher doesn't have a vision. Let me tell you what, I wrote out the vision five years ago for what I think Sagamore Baptist Church could do. And that vision should should last us the next 30 years. Okay. 30 years. Marlene, you're you're smiling and laughing. But let me tell you what, the the the, the things that I think God would have us to do, this is a long-term thing. Okay. You, this church has been here since 1910, not at this location, but has been around since 1910. Um uh, pastor Sturgis was the first pastor and uh, and he started this church and planted this church and there was a slew of other pastors that came and built upon that foundation and, and it grew and it grew and it grew and then it shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and now we're growing again. Okay. That tells me that God's hand has his hand of blessing has never been taken off Sagamore. Never. Okay. Now men may have stabbed the bride of Christ in the back, but God and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the great bridegroom, has never turned his back against his bride. Okay. We need to remember that. And the bridegroom is still blessing the bride and protecting the bride. Otherwise, Sagamore would not be here. Okay. Uh, there's people, I've, I've been to conventions in Ohio and Florida and uh, Tennessee and just Dallas, all, all sorts of different places. And you would not believe the witness of Sagamore Hill Baptist Church. It's all over the nation. Okay. And, and that tells me that God is not through with this church and that his hand of blessing is still upon us. Now, it's important for us to see that because the vision that I might have, I believe it's, it, it, it's you know, my vision can go by the wayside. When, whenever I die in the pulpit here or uh, God transitions me into a different ministry, guess what? Uh, my vision may die, but the revelation of God is always there. Okay. What I believe that we can do as a church may die, but what God knows that the church can do still lives on. Does that make sense? Okay. So I, I want us to see this because I think God's revelation is, is the key, is the key to what we're supposed to be doing. If COVID taught uh, my staff and me anything, it taught us this. There are certain things that we don't have to do because they're just not fruitful. And there's other things that we do need to do that are fruitful. I want to tell you, my, my oldest son texted me today and uh, it choked me up a little bit um, when he got home from school. He said, Dad, I hope you have a fruitful study tonight. I thought, I hope I have a fruitful study too. If we're unfruitful, there's something wrong with us. Okay. I want a fruitful study. And the way to do that is just to look at the word of God. Look at Isaiah 25 verse 7. Isaiah 25 7. <clears throat> Nick, before you leave that Proverbs there's an illustration exactly what you're just saying in Exodus. Mm -hmm. Moses went up to the mountain to receive the revelation. The people were down rioting around their golden calves. Yeah. Exodus, they were unrestrained. Exactly what, yeah. No, yeah. No, no restraint. Exactly mm -hmm. what that verse says. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the vision, he was just getting it. So look at Isaiah 25, 7. It says this, And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering 
which is over all peoples, even the veil, which is stretched over all nations. Okay. So the Lord is going to swallow up the covering. So all the peoples, even the veil, which is stretched out over all the nations. Now, that, that example, that illustration, Exodus, when Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law, like Dr. Cooper was saying, and the people are unrestrained and, and making the golden calves, okay? They're unrestrained. And they needed that revelation when Moses comes off the mountain with those two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. And, and they needed that veil lifted. You remember what, what the veiling looked like on Mount Sinai? You remember what the scriptures say? What, what what was around Mount Sinai? It was a it was a cloud. It was a cloud. You remember that symbolized the the presence of God when Moses was up there. <laughs> and then when Moses came down, what was what was on his face that frightened the people that were being unrestrained and sinning? The glory of uh, the Shekinah glory of God was all over his face, and they asked him to veil his face. Okay. So he's veiled up there with the presence of God uh, represented in that cloud. And then he comes down and the people are frightened when they see the glory of God on his face. And that was just a reflection. OK. And so uh, Isaiah says here and on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all peoples. You know, you know what swallows up the, the coverings on people's eyes over people's eyes and. Uh, that are lost. It's when the Lord takes that covering away and they see Jesus for the first time and they come to believe and trust in him. Okay. That's the unveiling. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ in somebody's heart. That's the grace of God that, that he would do that for anybody. Okay. Now how he does that, we can uh, sit in theological circles and discuss all day long why he does it the way he does it. We do not have the mind of God and we don't we, we don't have his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. But he does it according to his grace. We do know that much uh, when he opens the eyes of somebody to be saved. Look at Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 and th uh, through 3. Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> and this is going to be our last passage of scripture. Uh, this evening, Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come in your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Uh, this prophetic word from Isaiah, uh, think about what it is that he's going, uh, that, that he's saying. Uh, the light of the Lord has come, okay? The light has come. It's, it's through the person of Jesus Christ. Those of you that are watching online, those that are watching this video later, the light has come and he has come to brighten your day by bringing salvation to you. His name is Jesus. He was God's only begotten son, our heavenly father's only begotten son who came from heaven. The second person of the Trinity came from heaven to this earth in order that he might live a perfectly sinless life, going to the cross and dying for us and shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And he did this willfully following his father's uh, will. And then he was buried. And on that third day, he was raised from the dead in order that we might have everlasting life. He conquered death, hell, and the grave is what he did uh, through his action. Now, this is the precious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the light that has come into the world. When you look at John chapter 1, uh, in verse, uh, I think it's verse 4 or verse 5 in John chapter 1, uh, he says that the light has come into the world. And we know who that light is. It's the Logos, the Word of God, in chapter 1, verse 1 who created everything in John chapter one, verse 13. And what he did uh, in verse 14 of John chapter one, he came and he pitched his tent with us and dwelt among us. He tabernacled with us. And in verse 18 of John chapter one, uh, he has shown us grace and grace and grace. He has shown us truth upon truth and grace upon grace. This is who Jesus Christ is. 
Now, the only way, the only way that anyone can come to know Jesus Christ is through the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. So now we come full circle. This is the reason to know doctrine, to know theology. This is the reason that we learn what it is that we learn in these confessions and what we learn from the word of God and that he desires for us to know. That word know, K-N-O-W, is used over 950 times in this book, okay? Nowhere in this book will you ever find where God says, this is how I want you to feel. Nowhere does it say that, okay? He wants you to know. He wants you to know. He wants you to know, K-N-O-W, okay? Because your feelings, it's kind of like those roller coasters at Six Flags. They go up and down, up and down. There's woes, uh, that one that goes loop-de-loop a couple of times. And then there's that one that just goes in circles, okay? That's how feelings are. Sometimes they, they kind of go down, <laughs> down like that too, okay? No, he wants us to know so that the knowledge controls how we feel. And so that the knowledge uh, that we have in Jesus Christ, we come to realize who we are in him, uh, who is the light of the world. We're not the light, but we certainly reflect the light that is in us and uh, by his Holy Spirit and by his word. All right. Well, that is our lesson for tonight. And for those of you that are online and anybody that's here, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you can tonight. It's just a matter of coming to his throne of grace and saying, I'm a sinner. I, I've heard this lesson and I want to be saved. Jesus, will you forgive me of my sin and will you save me? And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confessed that Jesus is Christ and Lord with your mouth, the Bible says that you shall be saved. The beautiful thing about it, it's saying you shall be saved, is there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's satisfaction guaranteed if you'll trust Jesus Christ. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to be able to uh, speak your word and to speak the gospel. Lord, if there's that one man, that one woman, boy or girl, that one somebody that's out there that's listening that needs Jesus, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would come to you in belief, trusting you, Jesus, for the work that you've done by dying for our sins and shedding your blood for our sins by being buried and being raised again according to the scriptures so that we might have everlasting life. Thank you for showing us your word and the extent of this grace that you give. You give this grace to all that they might hear and you give them the opportunity to respond. And so we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us as we go out and share this good news with others. And we pray for those that will listen, that you'll bring them to the Lord as well. Lord, tonight I lift up Jaime to you. I've been speaking with him for several weeks now, and I just pray that you would pierce his heart with this good news and that you would enlighten his heart and his mind with Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we pray and believe. Amen. I love you. I'll see you next time with a Bible in my hand and a smile on my face. Love you guys.